Hi. So today I want to discuss something called psychrometrics, which is an overly verbose and fancy word to describe the study of mixtures of air with water vapor. Because all real air, unless the relative humidity is at 0%, contains water vapor. And remember, water vapor is gaseous water and should not be confused with steam. Because steam is droplets of liquid water that have actually condensed back into the air because of essentially over 100% humidity. And, well, by the end of this video, you'll hopefully understand what does 63% or 62% oh, it keeps fluctuating because of a bunch of reasons relative humidity actually mean. I'll give you the spoiler answer right now. Relative humidity is the ratio between what's called the partial pressure of water vapor and what's called the vapor pressure of liquid water. So to start off, we're going to sort of start some something running here, which is you see it's 23 degrees Celsius and 64% relative humidity. And I also have this alcohol thermometer here, this just regular thermometer thermometer, which is also reading 23 degrees Celsius. So we're going to take this and we're going to put a wet paper towel on here. And this is going to measure what's called the wet bulb temperature for us, which we'll get into when, uh, well, when we get to it. So we're going to have to go down a series of recursive rabbit holes here, though, because to understand humidity, you have to understand partial pressure. Remember, it's the ratio of partial pressure of water vapor to the vapor pressure. So, well, what's partial pressure? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's the partial pressure of one type of gas. But to understand what that really means, we're going to have to understand the ideal gas law, which is also helpful for me to explain because it will be a pretty nice primer for my entropy video if you also want to watch that one whenever I'm done with it. And one of the many reasons that I'm talking about this is that I've been unable to 3D print hygroscopic filaments for demonstrations that I need in order to do my entropy video. Because the humidity has been close to 100% because it's been raining. So the ideal gas law, if you've encountered it in a chemistry or a physics course, is PV equals NRT, right? Pressure times volume is equal to the number of moles of gas that you have times the ideal gas constant times the temperature. And so there's a lot of things that are encoded in that equation, right? And it's something you'll really get a lot of mileage out of having a good understanding of because it has the word ideal in it, right? And so nothing is really an ideal gas, but there's a lot of things that are pretty close, including air. And even when things have non-ideal behavior, you can still understand sort of vaguely how things scale and how a lot of thermodynamics variables are related to one another just by sort of going back to the ideal gas law. So experimentally, you can do a bunch of sort of things to discover, you know, or sort of, you know, retcon discover all of these different laws, which were historically discovered experimentally. And they all kind of make sense in retrospect, right? So you have that pressure times a volume times volume is a constant, right? If you take a given volume of gas and you squeeze it, the pressure is going to go up, right? Which is how you inflate a balloon in the first place, right? You take what, well, like this, you know, this thing, right? And it, this, this, we're compressing the gas inside the cylinder and that makes the pressure go up. And so it inflates the balloon. I got this one at the dollar store, so it's not very good. But every time we compress the volume, but keep the temperature the same, the pressure goes up and it inflates the balloon a little bit. Or also, of course, that's what you do with your lungs when you inflate it. Which actually, that's a problematic demo because the pressure in the balloon is related to the properties of the balloon, its elasticity and whatnot, and we're not actually keeping the number of moles of gas the same. We're putting more moles of gas in as it gets inflated. So here's me futzing with this tube full of water and showing what happens when you just increase the pressure of a fixed quantity of gas. 
So notice it starts off with the tube unsealed, and the level of the water is just the same on both sides, because that's how water pressure works. And But if I then seal the end of the tube with a rubber band and a little cut-off piece of balloon, then if I raise one side of it, the water on the other side does still go up, but it doesn't stay level with the other side, and now it actually is compressing the air, and the volume in the sealed off section is decreasing as the pressure goes up, with P times V equal to a constant. And I can also blow into the tube to increase the pressure even further, which will push the water level up a bit more as it compresses the air still further. Pressure times volume always being a constant, because temperature is constant, the number of moles is constant. And here's a similar-ish demonstration where I've taken the whole thing underwater, and I'm just squeezing that balloon to increase the pressure by decreasing the volume, and when I do that, it is able to displace the water from inside that bottle. You see the water level goes up as I allow it to expand, because it expands and the pressure goes down, and it's not able to displace as much water. And then I compress it, the pressure goes up, and it's able to displace more water, which it's maybe a little bit counterintuitive there, because I'm squeezing the balloon, and that is decreasing the available volume in total between the balloon and the water bottle, and as a result it's able to displace water further underwater, because the bottle's upside down. But again, number of moles is constant, because there's just the air that I've taken underwater, and the temperature is a constant. In fact, it's very constant, because it's in thermal contact with all of that water. And the next one that is actually really cool, because it's how you learn about the idea of absolute zero temperature, is that the volume at a constant pressure divided by the temperature is a constant, right? And so if that implies that volume is proportional to temperature at constant pressure, and so since you can't have less than zero volume, right, nothing can be smaller than non-existent, that implies that there's also some absolute zero of temperature, and indeed you can follow the slope to the x-intercept if you plot volume as a function of temperature, and you can find absolute zero, which is minus 273 degrees Celsius, minus 400 something degrees Fahrenheit. So you can convert to Kelvin, which is Celsius plus 273, or to something called Rankine, which is Fahrenheit plus the Fahrenheit degrees for your temperature plus four something. I can't remember the absolute zero, but it's 400 something degrees. I think like 430. And actually, here's a demo of that. Let's go ahead and apply some pressure to this cylinder I've built with a 3D printed outer sleeve and an aluminum can. And now it's friction locked, so that'll hold a constant pressure. And we'll increase the temperature. And it'll also be a decent enough seal. And lo and behold, volume goes up. And there's also this demo, which is also kind of putting together multiple gas laws, but it's still the ideal gas law, and it's a cool demo. So we're going to raise the pressure just a little bit, but mostly we're going to raise the temperature, and that balloon is leaking, but it's leaking on purpose. So we're going to get the temperature in there hot. We're going to let the number of moles of gas decrease a little bit, and it's going to be pretty much at atmospheric pressure, and then we're going to cool it down real fast. And boom, can implodes on itself. Kind of cool. And so that one's maybe a little bit unintuitive, but shows you something really, really, well, literally cool about the universe. And then there's a series of other ones that are, they might seem trivial and almost obvious, but they're actually really important, right? There's, including the one that says that the volume divided by the number of gas molecules or the volume divided by the number of moles is a constant. And that seems like trivial, right? It's just like, oh, if you add more gas, it takes up more volume. But you'll notice it's linear, right? If you add 
twice as much gas, it takes up twice as much volume, and there's nothing else going on, right? As long as it's the same pressure and temperature, more gas takes up more volume in a completely linear way for an ideal gas. Seems trivial. It's going to be really important, though. And then there's the linear relationship between pressure and temperature, right? Which also kind of makes sense, right? If you take something and heat it up, where's my handy-dandy lighter of science? Oh, here it is. And then, you know, take something like this balloon on this can. This is the safe, ver safe version of this demo because this can is not sealed except by a balloon, which is a pretty low-pressure membrane. And if I just uh, let it get uh, a bit hotter in there, it will start inflating the balloon as the pressure goes up. I think uh, this one is relatively intuitive. See if I can get it to uh, pop off. Oh, I think it's starting to leak. But anyways, oh, right. And then I also have this ice here, so I can do it the other way. See, pressure goes back down. Although, of course, that's a little bit of a uh, more complicated, right? Because the balloon actually is increasing the volume a little bit, but not by much, right? This, this little balloon at the top is small compared to the volume of the can. Uh, so then you have some other sort of useful equations, right? There is that the number of molecules times the temperature is equal to a constant, and that's the one that facilitates the existence of hot air balloons, right? Because if you keep the pressure constant and the volume constant, there will be fewer gas molecules if you increase the temperature, right? So if you take the fixed volume, like the volume of a hot air balloon, and you take the pressure, which is because the hot air balloon is open to the atmosphere, it has to necessarily be at atmospheric pressure, but you increase the temperature, that results in there being less gas in the same volume, which means that it weighs less, and so it becomes buoyant in the atmosphere and, well, rises because it's a hot air balloon just like this improvised one I'm about to demonstrate. Or we turn on our burner, get a good healthy flow of low density, but atmospheric pressure air, because it's nice and hot, but pressure is still one atmosphere. Boop, up it goes, works like a charm. And so then finally you have another one that's sort of seemingly trivial, but again, really important, which is that if you cram more gas molecules into the same space, the pressure also increases in a linearly proportional manner to the number of gas molecules or the number of moles of gas. So if you add twice as much gas to the same volume, you will double the pressure and it will just remain linear. Again, all of these are for an ideal gas, but lots of things are very close to ideal and you can understand a lot of things even when they're non-ideal by understanding the ideal gas law. So we have this sort of combination of different equations that we can derive through experiments. And at a certain point, people realized you can combine all of them because you have all these different, you know, variables held equal to a constant. And you can eventually combine them all to realize that pressure divided by vo pressure times volume divided by the number of moles of gas times the temperature is equal to the ideal gas constant. So you can arrive at that experimentally, but what's the theoretical explanation for it? And theories are almost always retcons, and this one's no exception, but we're going to go through something called the kinetic theory of gases, which explains, in terms of some very simple assumptions, why the ideal gas law is true. So we're really just going to make two critical assumptions, which you can sort of encode in one. And we're going to say, the gas molecules don't really interact with each other, other than that they occasionally bounce off of one another. And all that does is ensure that they're all at the same temperature. So you can't have like one temperature for nitrogen and a different temperature for oxygen in the same volume, right? In this, it, not in the sense of the same quantity of volume, but in the sense of like the same, like, you know, if like in this room, there's not different temperatures for the oxygen and the nitrogen. It's just the temperature of the room. And that assumption is actually a little bit dodgy because the idea of temperature is kind of weird in the first place, but we're just going to go with it because 
thermodynamics is kind of a weird subject, and I really like it in part because I find sort of things like air conditioning and cooling technology to be a sort of black magic because we've had, you know, fire since the dawn of human civilization, but uh, the ability to make things really, really cold is something very new and weird. But I also like thermodynamics because it's a series of approximations and where we just kind of average things together. But somehow those approximations, even though they're based on weird and kind of sketchy assumptions, are actually proven to be more enduring and more accurate than a lot of supposedly intrinsic laws of physics, which is just baffling. But um, I don't know. I guess it maybe doesn't bode well for me because all of the people that have been fascinated by thermodynamics and especially by entropy have uh, met pretty depressing li fates and had met pretty uh, depressing fates and not had the happiest of lives. But I don't know. I... Uh, I'm just fascinated by thermodynamics because it's just, it's so weird that it works so well, even though it's like, it's not even an actual theory of physics. It's all just all approximations, but they just work so well. But so if we make that assumption that there is such a thing as temperature and all the gas molecules have the same temperature, and other than that, they don't really interact with each other, we can derive from the kinetic theory of gases, the ideal gas law. So what do we do? Well, let's start off thinking about just one molecule, right? Because we said they don't really interact with each other. And remember, I said that those, you know, things, those laws where it's all just proportional to the number of moles are really critical, right? So that's going to let us consider one gas molecule at a time. And then when we're done, we can just multiply everything by Avogadro's number and get the macroscopic pressure and volume, etc. So let's think about one gas molecule for now, and let's have it inside of some cube of size L. So L by L by L cube. So the volume is L cubed, and the surface area is L squared, and the length is L. So the ga one individual gas molecule inside of that volume is going to have some velocity. And for now, we're just going to call it V sub J, and V sub J is some average velocity, but we're going to be doing lots and lots of averaging. That's what thermodynamics is all about. So we take the average velocity of the gas molecule, and we say, what happens when that gas molecule at that average velocity bounces off of a wall? Well, that's where the pressure is going to come from, right? That's the origin of pressure, is that the molecules bounce off of the walls of their container, and that will, on average, exert some force on the walls of the container. So when a gas molecule hits the wall, it hits it with, we'll call it average velocity V sub J, where J is the J direction, right? Because there's X, Y, and Z, but it could be any of them. And we'll just call it V sub J, and we're going to say it has some average velocity in the j direction, v sub j, which j could be x, y, or z. And then we're going to say, what happens when it bounces off the wall? Well, it goes from moving towards the wall, which we're going to say is plus v, and then it turns around, and we're going to say it doesn't lose any energy when it collides with the wall, and it leaves with velocity minus v sub j. So it goes from plus v sub j to minus v sub j, so it's changed its velocity by 2 times v sub j. And so therefore, it's changed its momentum by 2 times its mass times V sub J. And a change in momentum is getting closer to what we want because we want a pressure. So let's just keep in the back of our minds, we want a pressure. But we have a change in momentum, so that's getting closer because next thing we're going to get is a force, right? So force is change in momentum divided by the amount of time that it takes for that momentum to be ch exchanged. And we're doing all of this on average, right? So the average change in momentum for a gas molecule colliding with a wall is 2 times m times v sub j. Next question, what's the average amount of time it takes for a gas molecule to bounce off of a wall? Well, remember, it's a cube of length l. And if it's traveling with velocity v sub j in the direction perpendicular to the wall, and then the other wall is distance l away, it's going to take L divided by V sub J amount of time 
to collide with the other wall. So the average amount of time it takes between collisions is L divided by V sub J. So now we have delta P divided by delta T on average, which is equal to two times V sub J squared divided by L because two V sub two times M times V sub J divided by L divided by V and then, you know, do the double divide becomes, you know, moves the V sub J upstairs and we get two M V sub two M V sub J squared divided by L. Okay. So now we have a force, an average force, but what is pressure but force per unit area, right? So the area, because it's a cube, is just L squared. And so then we just do 2m v sub j squared divided by L times 1 over L squared. But now we have L times L squared. That's L cubed. L cubed is handy dandy volume of the cube. So hey, now we have pressure is equal to something divided by volume, which we can quickly rearrange to pressure times volume is equal to something. So that's getting us quite a bit closer, right? We don't have PV equals NRT, but we have PV equals something. And that something doesn't depend on temperature yet. And this is where we're going to have to make another, not dodgy assumption, but we're going to have to go back to the same assumption. And it's using something called the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which just says that the idea of temperature makes sense in the first place, which it honestly only sort of does, like, because the zeroth law of thermodynamics says that any two systems in equilibrium with a third system are in equilibrium with each other. And it underpins all the other laws of thermodynamics because the other three are basically conservation of energy, the increase of entropy, and something about absolute zero and entropy. But all three of those laws are underpinned by this idea that there is such a thing as thermal equilibrium and temperature in the first place. And there only sort of is, but at the same time, you can get such phenomenally accurate results by assuming that there is that it, 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 it's weird because equilibrium, which equilibrium implies that in some sense, it implies that entropy is already maximal. Again, tune in next week for a more detailed explanation or more likely next month. But equilibrium implies that everything is already sort of smoothed out in an optimal way and already sort of achieved all of its balances and that never really happens right the real world is always dynamical life and weather are happening and there's always different little things changing and there's also a difference between equilibrium and steady state uh, again i'll get, get into that when i talk about entropy but nothing's ever really in equilibrium or it would be just kind of you know dead and perfectly smoothed out and nothing would be happening but we talk about these sort of quasi-equilibrium processes in thermodynamics. And so that's what we're going to do here. And I'm also going to sort of do some hand-waving to get around not talking too much about entropy in this video, and also to avoid doing a complicated integral, because we want to say, okay, we have something that's pressure times volume is equal to something, which depends on mv squared, which is the kinetic energy of a gas molecule, right? And you've probably heard mostly correctly that temperature is the random motion of atoms and molecules and whatever else at a microscopic level. And that is mostly true. It's just not quite quantitatively true, right? The actual number of how you measure temperature is not just equal to the average energy per se. Um, I'll get into it when I talk about entropy. For now, you're going to have to take my word for it that the average kinetic energy of a molecule is not equal to the temperature. It's actually equal to 3 times the temperature times something called the Boltzmann constant. And the Boltzmann constant is just the ideal gas constant, but for a single molecule instead of for a mole. So it's just R divided by Avogadro's number. That's all the Boltzmann constant is. It's going to come up again when I talk about entropy, though, so if you would like to learn more about that, uh, I guess tune in next time for the exciting conclusion, and or you can just look it up right now. And 
there's also something you have to do. There's an integral you have to do over something called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. I'm not going to do that integral today. I might not even do it in the next video. I'll probably show it in the next video, but just take my word for it for now that there's a factor of three in there. What it's going to do for us is, remember I said V sub J is the velocity in any given given direction, right? Well, there's also two other directions. So the total kinetic energy is V sub J plus, you know, V sub other two directions squared, right? So it's V sub J squared plus, you know, V sub K squared plus V sub L squared. But remember, we said it was the average velocity and all directions are the same. So the average kinetic energy is equal to three halves times M times V sub J squared. And so how do we cancel out that three? Well, we just throw that other three in there. It's not actually pulled out of thin air though. It's based on doing an integral over something called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution in three dimensions. But what's the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution? Either take my word for it or pause the video and look it up on Wikipedia or any other fine source of information about physics and chemistry or wait until the next video and I'll explain it in more detail. But for now, take my word for it. It's not just T, it's three times T. And so that cancels out the other three though. And so now we have that the kinetic energy is equal to three times T times the Boltzmann constant. We already had that the pressure times the volume is equal to essentially four times the kinetic energy in any given direction or four times V sub J squared and we rearrange everything and we get what we wanted, which is P times V is equal to not quite NRT, but equal to KB times T for a individual molecule, right? Remember, we did all this for one molecule at a time. And this is where the magic of the ideal gas comes in, where we made that assumption that they don't really interact with each other. And so we assumed that there's no like van der Waals forces or anything like that. And we're also assuming that they don't really affect how long it takes in between bounces off of the walls. In reality, there's something called the mean free path, which is typically much shorter than the size of a container you might consider, but it still turns out to be a good approximation to say that the gas molecules don't get in each other's way very often, even though they bounce off of each other pretty frequently. And so if we, go from one gas molecule to Avogadro's number of gas molecules, well, we just multiply everything by Avogadro's number, right? And so PV equals KB times T simply becomes PV equals NRT, where N is the number of moles because the pressure for one molecule is equal to KB times T. So the pressure for Avogadro's number of molecules is equal to the Boltzmann constant times the temperature times Avogadro's number, and Avogadro's number times the Boltzmann constant is R, and then for n moles instead of one mole, it's nRT. So PV equals nRT. We have derived it from some very simple assumptions. We had to do some hand waving there to get that factor of three, but other than that, you know, pay no attention to the assumptions behind the curtain. Everything's all honky-dory. But remember, I promised we were going to talk about psychrometrics and partial pressures. So now we're ready to talk about partial pressure. And hopefully the way I've explained ideal gases, partial pressure is a very easy idea to understand, right? Any given molecule exerts its own pressure independent of anything else in the room. And that's also true of any given type of gas, right? If the air is like 70% nitrogen, 30% oxygen, then 30% of the total pressure, at atmospheric pressure, is the pressure due to oxygen molecules, and 70% is the pressure due to nitrogen molecules. Well, there's also a partial pressure of water vapor. And all of them together are equal to the actual total pressure, which is generally about 100,000 pascals or 100,000 newtons per square meter at sea level, although of course it depends on both the weather and on your altitude. And you might wonder, well, okay, well then isn't relative humidity just the pressure of water vapor divided by the total pressure? No, because if, if you think about it, it says 65% right now. 
If it were 65% water vapor in this room, well, the total pressure is still one atmosphere, right? So I would be suffocating if 65% of this room were water vapor because there would only be 35% as much oxygen, which is not enough. <laughs> and I would be unconscious and on my way to being dead. So what's the relative humidity then? Well, the relative humidity is the ratio between the partial pressure of water vapor and the maximum that it could be at that temperature, which is something called the vapor pressure of liquid water at that temperature. And if you're curious, the highest the partial pressure of water vapor can ever be is about 0.1 atmospheres, because if you have 100 degrees Fahrenheit or about 35 degrees Celsius, and you have 100% relative humidity, the vapor pressure of liquid water at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 degrees Celsius, is about uh, 0.1 atmospheres. So uh, what that was that a uh, uh, thousand pascals or sorry 10,000 pascals and that's not nothing right so it's it's is actually harder to breathe when it's really really humid out but 10 percent of the atmospheric pressure that turns out to be equivalent to an increase in altitude of about 1,000 meters or 3,000 feet so that's that's definitely not nothing. Like, going up 3,000 feet, you can definitely feel it. And then, of course, if you're also not at sea level to start with, it compounds with that. So when it's really humid out, it is genuinely harder to breathe. It's not just the fact that it's harder to cool off. It's mostly the fact that it's harder to cool off that causes you to have heavy labored breathing when it's really hot and really humid. But it's also the fact that there's just less oxygen. But so if it's the ratio between the partial pressure, which hopefully that idea makes sense now, right? If every gas molecule just exerts its own independent pressure and there's some percentage of the total air volume that is water molecules, then there's they account for a certain part of the pressure, the partial pressure of water vapor. But what's the vapor pressure of liquid water? Well, that is the pressure of liquid water in equilibrium with water vapor at a given temperature. Right, and so that's based on this phase diagram of water, where there is, at any given temperature, a pressure where you can have both liquid water and water vapor. If you go above that pressure, you have only liquid water, and if you go below that pressure, you have only water vapor. And conversely, if you get hotter, you have only water vapor. If you get colder, you have only liquid water. But if you move along that curve, keeping the pressure equal to the vapor pressure, then you can have both. And if I take the humidity meter and put it inside of a sealed volume with plenty of liquid water, that's exactly what will happen. The liquid water will evaporate until it's at a point where the partial pressure of water vapor inside the jar is equal to the vapor pressure of water at that temperature, and the humidity meter will read 100%, and the jar will start fogging up because it's at the dew point. And it'll fog up considerably because I used warm water to speed this up. Since it already took a while, the humidity meter doesn't update very quickly. This is a time lapse even. It's taking its time getting all the way up, but it does eventually go to 99%. It only has two digits, so it can't read 100. And this is where the concept of equilibrium gets kind of weird again. In the case of the jar, it reaches 100% humidity, and then the water stops evaporating, and it reaches a local equilibrium inside the jar. Before... There we go, 99. So that brings us back to this wet bulb temperature, right? Where it has now cooled down to a few degrees below its temperature. So you can see this is reading, this is what we call the dry bulb temperature. It's just the temperature, which is reading 21 Celsius. And you can hopefully see that this one is reading more like 17 or 18 degrees Celsius, which is not too surprising, right? Because it's cooling off for the same reason that you cool off when you sweat. 
the liquid water evaporates, and when it does, it takes some energy for that to happen. But the thing about a wet bulb like that is that when the water cools off, it reduces the vapor pressure. And so the wet bulb temperature is the temperature where the vapor pressure of the colder water, which is colder than room temperature, is equal to the partial pressure of water vapor in the room. And this is also sometimes called the dew point because they're the same thing, but coming at it from the other direction, right? If you get the water, if you get the liquid water colder, then it's going to evaporate less, have a lower vapor pressure, and be in equilibrium that way. But if you get the air colder, you are going to reduce the vapor pressure of liquid water until you have 100% relative humidity. And then you will start to have dew condense out of the air, which is why it's called the dew point. And then the only way to reach equilibrium is for liquid water to form, and it rains. And in fact, that's why any time it's raining, the humidity is going to be 100%, unless you're indoors where the air has been warmed up. Or outdoors with air that has been warmed up. Just like by these explosions, because explosions make everything more interesting. And so this is also one reason that you have an air conditioner, or maybe you have one, depending on where you live and if you need one. You have an air conditioner, though, instead of an air cooler, right? Because any time you take air and you keep the partial pressure of water vapor the same, which if you're keeping the pressure the same, right, unless you're going inside of a a diving bell or something, you're going to continue to be at atmospheric pressure. And if you change the temperature, you're going to change the relative humidity. And so if you reduce the temperature, but you don't pull any moisture out, you are going to increase the relative humidity because the partial pressure is the same, but you have now increased or, sorry, the partial pressure is the same, but you have now decreased the vapor pressure because you've gone to a lower temperature. And so air conditioners, that's why air conditioners frequently have liquid water dripping out of them is because the cold side will actually get below the dew point and condense out some water. And then the air that it actually sends into the building or into the car, or into the room, what have you, is mixed back in with some of the outside air so that the result is air that is at a comfortable temperature and a comfortable humidity. Although it depends on where the air conditioner is designed for. If you're designing an air conditioner for a building in Arizona, then you might not mind some extra humidity, right? But if you're designing one to operate in, say, Florida, you really need to be careful to dehumidify the air and cool it, or it's going to be extremely damp and gross in the building. <laughs> so. There's a reason it's called an air conditioner and not just an air cooler. And so, well, hopefully all of that makes sense. That's dew point for you. That's relative humidity. That's the wet bulb temperature. Anytime you move along the phase boundary, you are going to change the vapor pressure of water. And if you keep the partial pressure of water vapor constant, that's going to change the relative humidity which I have one more demo that I'm going to have to go get, but with the magic of editing, it'll be instantaneous for you. All right, so now we're going to take this handy-dandy hairdryer of science and see what happens when we raise the temperature by using the heater inside of this hairdryer, but uh, don't do anything w about the partial pressure of water vapor. Spoiler, humidity goes down. And this is kind of loud, but... It's going to take a minute, so I'll time-lapse it for you. All right, there, so there we went from 
like 70% humidity all the way down to 45% humidity, albeit at the price of going up to 27 degrees Celsius and uh, getting my fingers pretty toasty in the process. Hopefully that uh, makes sense though, and was informative in some way. Tune in next week for the exciting conclusion where I will be talking about entropy. Hopefully you found this informative in and of itself. Please do let me know if you have any questions. I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, yeah, I guess thanks for watching. Bye.